Welcome Just Lady Ada. Hey everybody, and welcome Just Lady Ada. We've got fun-filled Saturday night. Tomorrow uh, we're going to see a friend, so uh, it's Sunday night, so we thought we would stream tonight. Why not? Get get it done a little bit early. When we say friends, you know, sometimes our friends have the Prince Floppy from 30 years ago. Sometimes uh, they, they uh, make interesting 3D printed things and they're designers. Other times they, they run things uh twitter who knows who, who our knows? friends are do you mind actually can you like tell because it's like shining right into my face what the the, the uh the computer that light sorry what yeah it's a little better sorry okay, it, was like, it was like right into my okay. eye but back i was like to, blinded all right great okay. back to the show okay so sorry. we're doing that tomorrow so we're doing this show tonight saturday night so let me just take care of some biz real quick okay? biz okay all right first go up, for it Go to adabox.com and sign up. We only have a few slots open. We ship the winter edition in January, February. You will regret if you don't do it. Uh, next up, um, people were like, hey, I saw that you got that Prince floppy, but um, what was on the disc? I know there's a font. There wasn't. It's just two tiffs. That is the, all that's really, on Really? There was only two tiffs. One big tiff and one small tiff, yeah. and they were both tiffs. And someone, you know, it's Twitter, so people were snarking on us, and they're like, you don't have a trackball on your PowerBook 180 that's pristine. I'm like, okay, well, I, I have a replacement on the way. Like, I don't know where... And you, you got it. I got it. So, yeah, it could work. Anyways, um, so here you can see me opening up the... The tiff that's on the flop that was Just on the tiff. floppy. But Phil, was there like a true type font? No. Was there a postcard font? No. Was there like a font suitcase thingy? No. Or was there just a tiff? Just a tiff. Two tiffs. So here you go. And so this is the piece of history. It's now on archive.org. Um, and so uh, I love tiffs. it's there. So and there's me. You use the office life. behind the scenes. There's me, master back on mm -hmm. in New York City indoors, so we were doing the right thing. And then um, I've been doing some behind the scenes stuff. Um, just, you know, publishing some of the things at Adafruit and more. This is uh, our Mona Lisa Octocat puppet that I hope that we'll be doing a show, a kid's show maybe, about coding and more one day. And then uh, speaking of, uh, the reason why I had this out is because uh, this is your GitHub contributions and then this is this like, you know. You can see where in the summer I kind of took like, you know, two months and I was like, oh, I was a little, ch I was ch trying to go outside a lot because I was yeah. like, if this winter is another, you know, COVID spike, I want to make sure that I get outside as much as possible yeah. when it's nice in New York, which is, you know, June, July, August. Okay. And then um, I've been taking photos um, and putting it on my personal account, twitter.com forward slash Peteron. And you can see some of the experiments I've been doing. Um, I'm hoping to do a little video show of my own. Um, but I wanted to do what's a max... The, wait, what's the video show going to be about? Oh, uh, you know, stuff and things. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to do this Max Centrum-like thing, and I wanted to have it black and white, and I wanted to do a lot of things. So this is kind of complicated because I can't just, like, do a normal thing. Um, but yeah, so uh, really I got it working. Yeah. So anywho, um, yeah. that's some of the stuff that's going on. Cool. Behind the scenes. So just Hi. a little bit of a reminder. Tuesday... JP's product pick Wednesday is going to be 3D hangs out with 3D hangouts with Noah and Pedro. Um, we may or may not do show and tell and um, ask an engineer because uh, Lamar was invited to an event I can't talk about yet, but it's a big deal. So and it's on Wednesday. It's on Wednesday, so we'll see. Um, and so we have a few things that we've been up to. The first thing is um, here's these hacker CDs. Uh, these are this is hacker soundtrack one, two, and three. And what I wanted to do is see if I can use my uh, power CD from Apple, uh, which you can see, you want to put it a little bit underneath there so you can see this is a CD player. And uh, I have a little video that went along with it. So I got it to work with the uh, AirPods Max. I just wanted, I, there's some repair work that we need to do on this thing, but anyways, I got it working. Here's a little clip. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Dinosaurs and man, two species separated by 65 million years of evolution, have just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together how can we possibly have the slightest idea of what to expect okay lots of pop culture references there and then i guess the the bigger news is um we tried to get the limited edition arduinos um but you can only just buy them as a person so i got 10 and uh i looked through all of them and one of them the lowest serial number was 16 and uh we're gonna do an unboxing right now we're gonna do okay it. and uh i already Wait, opened it up want, earlier do you want this power cd back I will. You can just put it down okay, now. Okay. Um, I did it. You know, I just wanted to put some photos up on Twitter. So they have all the founders. Um, they added uh, the new CEO, um, Fabio, and uh, you know, the Arduino had a little bit of a, a history. So one of the original founders is on there. Fabio, the new CEO, is on there. 
And uh, it's cool because it's, you know, you got this signature oh, thing. That's nice. And then I took a couple of quick photos. Um, it's tiny. And I it's thought. It's so cute. So I thought you'd do a little bit of an unboxing, and then I'm going to show um, where we're adding this. We have an Arduino Museum in Adafruit. Yeah. And we have a collection of things, and I'll, and I'll go over that in a second. But uh, how about we go to you, and you show us. Okay. Um, here you go. Yeah, so this is... You want me is... to shrink you down more for this? No, it's... Okay. It, this is fine. Okay, great. Yeah. This is fine. Yeah, we just we reorganized this room a little bit, so... Okay. okay. So there's the box, and so it's got this nice gold thing. So they're, they're going black and gold, which I'm, I'm digging. There's a little hologram yeah. uh, here. Okay. Open this box. Oh, it's so cute. And this is like a little micro Arduino. So, well, yeah, this pops out, and there's a little foam protector, and then I don't think there's anything underneath it, right? No, but if you take the uh, the box out, you could see the signatures and more. Where's the other side? Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Good, good idea. Okay. So the okay, the so only they... person's missing is Jen Luca, who was part of the original Arduino team, but there was a split with Arduino, so I get why they did this. Um, yeah, you know. and these are two little. Um, I think these are probably 0.05 um, inch headers. So they're this is you know one quarter size maybe of uh, an Arduino Uno, and then this is the Arduino Uno for scale. So yeah, it's like one quarter size almost exactly. And can that kind of fit inside? This is a little carrier. So this is like when you have like a yacht, yeah. and then you so, have a little like jet ski in the yacht that can go yeah. out, and then it's like, hi. Yeah, so people were asking how big it is. Well, there it is. It looks like a, a miniature um, Uno. Yeah. So, um, yeah. do you have anything else you want to show there? Because I have, I have some uh, history stuff to show about the Arduino. Uh, the only thing is, is that like, you know, for the headers, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's finer pitch. Um, but you can solder pads, and it's got this cool gold. I don't know if people are going to use it or collect it. I mean, I'm collecting it. I mean, I'm just collecting it because it's cute. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's got the castellated pads. Yeah. I guess someone's going to make, like, a mini shield. I do like the black and gold. I mean, everyone knows I love black and gold. And I'm sure this is functional. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, I mean, USB-C and, like... USB-C, and there's you know, the Arduino. They're, they're, everyone's going through a chip shortage. This might have been something that they needed to do just to, you know, hey, we got 10 million boards out there. Yeah, and we, and we will talk about this later. So this has an at Mega 16 u 2 as the um, co-processor for USB to serial, which we'll, which we'll chat about. But um, anyways, this is okay. very cute. So, so cute. It's history time. Um, so uh, we're adding this to our Arduino Museum. And let me just be really super, super duper clear. We've been doing stuff with Arduino for over 10 years. Here's Lady Ada with blonde hair. So I there's Jen Luca, left. Massimo. Lady Ada, Massimo, Tom Igo, David Cartelius, and David Mellis. They were at our apartment when they for its apartment. And I have, I think, the only... Original Arduino team signatures. And I'm selling this on QVC next week. For $99 million. No. Um, and so then I wrote an article about why Arduino won, why it's here to stay. And I have to do an update because it is now 10 years old. And we have some history because Lady Ada was working on a thing where it was Arduino-like at the time. It was an FTDI thing. Massimo, um, he said this event, said he saw Lemoore's design. So, you know, open source is kind of neat. And um, one of the things that we did, and the reason why I bought this um, little mini Arduino, is because I have a collection. So this one's going to go with our collection when Adafruit was asked to help out when there was the Arduino.cc split, and there was Arduino.org. And we were working with the US team, Massimo and team, and we wanted to help them out. So this is the panel, and Adafruit was manufacturing the Unos. And I'm going to show you um, the first 18 seconds when Massimo was on site at Adafruit as it came off the assembly line with it, Lady Ada, and here's 18 seconds, and this is from uh, 2015. No, I yeah. have the dates. Okay. I'm an archivist. It's Lady Ada Massimo. They are putting together the first Arduinos okay. from Arduino.cc in New York, New York, the USA. First, the first Arduino Unos manufactured in the U.S. Yeah. Great. Legally. <laughs> Now you just have to make sure they work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, get your testers out. Next step. Okay. And you're probably wondering, hey, Phil, so Massimo and Lady Ada are holding up the very first Arduino made in the USA. Uh, where is it now? Well, I got them to sign the back of it at the time, and it's in the Adafruit Arduino Museum. And it is uh, a rare thing to find out in the world now, um, but 
we were making them in USA. Here's our team. We were boxing them up. We were sending them off. And uh, later on, um, they made the micro, and it says co-designed with Adafruit. They based it off one of our designs. Um, it was nice to put, uh, that they put some credit on the back. Thank you. And then we made the Gemma, and that was the Arduino Gemma. We still have the Gemma. And then, you know, over time, um, what happened was libraries and software and code really is what drives a lot of the things that goes on with Arduino. And uh, Arduino at one of their events said, congratulations, Adafruit, for being the most downloaded library. So still to this day, they don't publish them anymore, but um, Adafruit stuff is the most downloaded, most used. And people love our libraries. And uh, we're very proud of it because we wanted to be part of this big community. And it's, you know, Arduino's in our community. We're in their community. It's one big community. And uh, it's kind of cool that this is uh, a lot of history here. So joining the uh, Arduino's and the Adafruit Museum of all things Arduino related and more, Yay. you'll be able to see all these things. And uh, congratulations, Arduino, on shipping out this cool little board just in time for the holidays. Yay. Okay. Okay, yeah, and, we got some. And that's the news. Okay, me. cool. All right, well, um, for me, I got a couple things going on. I'm going to check my notes now because I, I was so amazed by it. Okay, so we did the mini unboxing. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so let's go to the overhead and I'll show off. I've got um, the... Uh, let's see the Uno. So I got the got my prototypes in. So I started making. I made uh, this Feather M4, um, Ada Logger, which I was excited about. And um, you can see if you look really carefully, I got a couple transistors flipped up. It's actually something that I, I make a mistake on a couple times. So I'm gonna like this is like the second time I think I've made this mistake where I I have the P channel FET on backwards because I have it in as like the ideal diode configuration, not as the high side switch so you know you can kind of bend the pins over and like solder it and like twist it around to, to get the um the uh, em, uh not emitter the uh drain the source um swapped and um otherwise it pretty much worked the other thing i changed is um i was using a like i said a high side switch for the stem iqt connector but um which worked fine as long as the stem iqt sensor was not a high current sensor um, but the minute I tried to connect something like, you know, a CO2 sensor or, you know, a big OLED, something that like used, you know, a significant amount of current on startup, um, the capacitors on the board um, would drain the 3.3 volt regular because there's not a lot of 3.3 um, uh, volt. I mean, there's a lot of 10 microfarad capacitors. And if I replace them all with 22 microfarad, it was kind of marginal. But, you know, the more you add, the the bigger that load is when you switch on um, that high side switch, you have to dump current into the capacitors and it was browning out the chip and the, and the, the brownout on the SAMD51, we have it quite strong. You know, we have it on at 2.7 volts um, because the SAMD51 we found if you, um, if the voltage dropped too much, it actually had the, a high risk of uh, corrupting the bootloader. So we always set the, the brownout detect to um, 2.7 volts. So upshot is, is that we, you know, I'm replacing this um, high side, uh, P channel FET with a uh, regulator and I'm just turning the enable on and off and that's that's going to be you know perfectly fine and since that is sucking power from the USB or battery you're not going to have that risk of a brownout because even if it dips you know 0.6 volts it's still well above the um the LDO voltage so I think they'll fix it so I ordered another set of prototypes but otherwise you know the design um worked quite quite well and what's funny is um the chip I'm using on the same the 51J20 um, is a bigger one than this one on the Feather M4 now, the J19. When I first designed the Feather M4, I believe it could not get J20s. I think J19s were kind of like the best chips that were available. There was something there was some, and there was something up that made it so that I didn't use the J20s. But ironically, w when we booked, you know, a year ago, we booked like two years worth of chips because there was a chip shortage. So we're like, we're going to book them all. The, our J20s all came in. Um, before the J19, so ironically, it's the other way now. It's like I can get the bigger chip faster than the the smaller chip. Um, so great, the Feather M4 is going to get an upgrade. Congratulations! There's one one bright side to this uh, silicon shortage. But so I'm excited for this design. So I ordered another set of prototypes pretty quickly. Um, another prototype that I'm doing that I thought was interesting because uh, you don't see this um, too often is I'm going to redesign the. Uh, Vemmel 7700, which is a um, light lux sensor. 
it's I squared C light sensor. And um, what's interesting about this is that the light sensor, you see the package here, the, the chip itself, the sensor actually comes in two variants on a reel. Um, the, the first variant is upward and the other variant is sideways. You can actually see that this is a sideways uh, focused sensor, like the, the direction which it's reading light is from the side. Uh, and it's the same sensor, right? It's just how is it packaged in the, um, the tape and reel. So one way is um, upright, so that would be like so. Sorry, this is hard to do over the overhead without tweezers. Yeah, it's slippery. Slippery bastard. Okay, <laughs> so one is upright, and the upright one, you know, it's like this, and you can see the chip up top. And the other way, the way that this is this particular strip comes in, um, the sensor is is to the side. Same package, but you know, just rotated. And I've seen this in a couple of light sensors, actually. Um, this is the, uh, the alternate orientation. I've seen this in a couple IR sensors and light sensors. I've seen, um, you know, they come in two versions. Basically, just really watch out. You know, if, if they have two versions on a tape and reel, it's the same part number, but there would be like one slight difference in, in the ending numbers. And you know, normally, those are the letters that you're like, oh, this is a temperature gradient or, um, you know, maybe precision. No, sometimes that letter means it's flipped in the tape and reel and like, it's, it's really useless. So that's why, um, watch out for that. I mean, in this case, I'm doing it on purpose. I'm going to carry both, um, because I think it's useful to have a, a right angle light sensor. That's not a very common orientation. Usually light sensors are, you know, they point up from the board. Um, but this one is, uh, they're orthogonal and this one is parallel, okay. right? Perpendicular parallel. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so this is a, a, a version of the, you know, I'm stomach QTFing this, and I'm going to make, you know, one PCB, two versions for it. Um, another thing is you go to the computer. Uh, one thing that's fun, I, I try to do this every year, but this year I'm really doing it, is um, Advent of Code. Um, it's super fun little puzzles that you can uh, program. Oh, if you want to learn Python or you want to get better at Python, it's it's excellent with Python. If you want to get better with C, it's terrible for C. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you could write all of these in C, but it would I, I personally think it would be a nightmare. It's a lot of text parsing, a lot of like list iteration and mapping and reducing, and it's just like C is not good for that. Um, Python will but it's great help, in Python. Help you, help you get these puzzles going. And the, and the data sets are, are big enough that you, you know, you're actually doing computation, but they're not so big that, it, you know, in Python, like, I'm, I'm quite lazy. Like, I'm just, I'll just use list comp comprehension, yeah, uh, list comps, comprehend, comp, list comprehensions, comprehensive comprehensions. Um, we know what you're talking about. I'll use, I'll use those, and I'll just kind of throw them around, and, you know, you're just using a ton of memory, and, and you're, then I throw away the data afterwards, and yeah, it's fine. Um, Do you think it'd be good for people who want to learn JavaScript? I, I think so. I don't know how good JavaScript is with string parsing, but I'll tell you just to get the data in, you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges so far, it's only it's only been four days, but the one of the biggest challenges we've noticed is like you want to get the data in cleanly and like that's not the hard part. So if you're you're like dicking around with like trying to parse out these strings and numbers and convert binary to to decimal and vice versa, and if you're like dealing with that. Um, I just feel like you're not going to have as much fun. Whereas, what's again, what's nice about like, Python is you're just you do like file that read lines, ding, you have all the data, and then you you know strip, take off the new line, split, you've parsed it out into an array, and then you can actually start working on the data once you have it in in format. And you just, I, whatever language you use, just don't pick one that sucks at string parsing. And C really sucks at string parsing, so that's why I recommend. It's great for Python learning, especially if you know a bit of Python and you want to get better at it, which is me. Um, I find that this is good because it'll kind of make you think like, oh, there must be like a Python built in that does this. And, you know, or especially NumPy. This is great if you want to like get better at NumPy and you want to have a little bit of exercise for it because um, there's a lot of like matrix flipping and inverting and like you want to slice it. It's there's a lot of this data manipulation. So that's. That's the other thing I'm doing for fun, for fun Ming. So that's that's all I got for Desk of Lady Ada. Okay, you want to do the research? Yes, yeah, so let's go to the research. Okay. Where in the world is the part I need? The great search with DJ Key. 
Okay, the great is brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit. Lady Ada uses her powers of engineering to find stuff on digikey.com. Lady Ada, what are you going to show? Okay, so let's go to the overhead because I'm actually going to show off just the things that are shown off. But again, in brief, to intro this oh, one segment. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. So much. Too much. Okay, so once upon a time, there were computers that had um, serial ports on them. Can you, can you show the serial port um, image? The Which right one? and then down two, down one. This one? Yeah, click that. So once upon a time, computers had serial ports. And um, this is a 25 port serial port, or maybe it's a parallel port. But they had nine pin or, or 25 pin ports on the back. And you could send and receive, you know, 8 bit serial data. Um, plus or minus 12 volts, but then, you know, you could convert that to, to 0 to 5 or 0 to 3 volts and use it to send and receive data from your electronics. And this was amazing and wonderful. And uh, we were in the Garden of Eden. And then, um, you know, people took away serial ports and then they were like, well, we took away your serial port, but it's okay because we're going to replace it with a USB port. And um, for like about 10 years, Microcontrollers did not have USB ports, but they did have serial ports, and so we were in this weird, murky period. Nowadays, um, more chips have built-in uh, USB ports, and I'll show one, but uh, if you go to the next image, okay. you can use something called a USB to serial converter, and this is one of the first circuits I made because it's very handy. It takes USB, on the left you see a USB B type, and on the right you see, you know, there's a chip and then a crystal, two LEDs, and then a couple pads. Um, the pads are not labeled because this is before you could get silk screen on PCBs for free. Ground power, RX and TX. And so the chip in the middle there, which is the FT232BM, I believe, was a chip that all it did was connect to USB and present a USB port uh, peripheral and convert that to serial. And um, go over to the computer. Um, a lot of microcontrollers now have native USB. So actually, I'll show. I was just showing this. Oh, can you do the overhead? So a board like this, Sandy 51 based board. Uh, it's the Cortex M0, and it has USB. And you'll notice there's no chip in between. It's just this chip and USB. It has a native USB converter. Uh, compare that to the Uno, which is earlier, and so. You have the microcontroller, and then this little chip here, and it's the USB serial converter. Um, and on the Metro Mini. We also have two chips, chip USB uh, converter. And, and you know, the, the micro bit actually also basically has a USB to serial converter, although it's USB slash serial slash JTAG, whatever. Um, but it, it has a little converter chip. And um, they're not incredibly expensive, but, you know, they're, they're an added cost. But, you know, if you're dealing with something like a RISC-V chip, it doesn't have native USB. or some, some chips just don't have it. And you might be stuck with the chip you have to use or you're upgrading some old design, use a USB serial converter. And so um, I showed the image of the FT232BM. That one's actually no longer made. Um, it was replaced with the FT232RL, which I also think is, is possibly close to being discontinued. Um, so this, uh, this, I think, uses a CP... Yeah, this is a CP2104. Uh, and that's another popular... Scilabs also makes... USB serial converters. Um, and of course, uh, the CP2104 was discontinued um, as, as chips are wont to do. And it was okay for, you know, three or four years because it was like discontinued, but you still get it. But now it's really discontinued. Um, it was, it's been, you know, they're, they're no longer making the 04. Why? I, I don't, you know, maybe there's a little mistake in it. Maybe they want to update it. Um, so it's been replaced. And then um, for Arduino, what they do, which I think is interesting, is they use actually a different microcontroller. The at mega 30 sorry at mega 16 u2 and the u stands for usb it's one of the first usb native chips that um at Mel made now you might say well wait a minute if this is a microcontroller that's basically the same as this why not just have one well the leonardo does it kind of combines both of them but there there are reasons why you might want to have separate you know mostly because there's a ton of code for this chip out there like like tens of thousands of projects maybe a hundred thousand projects and um, this is just a way of keeping it alive. And I think one of the reasons that Arduino did this, they went with a microcontroller, is to avoid that, like, oh, the parts discontinued, or we don't have control over it, or, or we don't want to customize it a little bit. Also, it can act as a generic CDC device, you don't need a special driver, a couple of reasons. But, and I'll say this is always a valid thing to do. You can always take a microcontroller and make a converter. 
That said, you know, I kind of like for this instance, I do sort of like to use chips that are off the shelf that just kind of do one thing and one thing only. I'm always a little nervous when you combine two microcontrollers. I always feel like you can do it, but there's always a little bit of risk. Um, so let's go to DigiKey and I'll show you the CP2104, which is again, the uh, chip I have loved and used. And you know, it says that it's available, but it's, it's NRND, you know, uh, not recommended for new designs. And having talked to Scilabs, you know, it's a good idea when this comes up, talk to the company and ask them like, what do you mean by that? Because believe me, companies have very wide ranges of what they mean by not recommended. It could be, I mean, I have the, from Scilabs, the SI, I think 1143, uh, you know, light sensor, and it's been NRND for like eight years, and I can still get it, right? But it's, they're like, we prefer use a different chip, which they also discontinued. Anyways, mm -hmm. so uh, the Scilab chip is not available, believe me, I'm, I'm, I have like the last shipment for, that they're making. They're like, we're done. Um, but they do make others. And I'll say that it was trying to search for like USB to UR. I wasn't, it wasn't as easy to find the category um, because it's, it's a little, it's a little weird location. So what I think I found easiest to do is just to click on the function because it's a very specific function. And um, let's just view all the similar ones. So there's a couple, some of which are a little bit like, it's a little bit intense. Um, but we just want active ones because uh, we don't want to get stuck again. I think, uh, yeah. And so there's a couple options. So I'll say that um, of the chips, there are a few families. So Microchip makes um, MCP22, you know, they have a, a series of chips. Scilabs, um, like I said, Cypress, um, MaxLinear, I've never tried, FTDI, I, I've used a lot. So my personal opinion is the microchip ones are good, but they really are a microcontroller that they are reprogramming to act as a USB to serial converter, which is, I'm not against, but I just haven't, haven't used it as much. The one time I used Cypress, it was also a microcontroller that they had re basically just reprogrammed and they packaged it programmed with USB to a serial converter code on it. And I found it was a little flaky. Um, what do I mean by that? So USB serial converters, it's like you'd think... It only has one job to do, how hard can it be? But there's actually a lot of little lot of little details. For example, when you open up the serial port, what happens to the control lines, the DTR and the RTS and the CTS lines? And some play, you know, some chips like toggle them back and forth, or some of them they don't have like when you try to set the control lines, it doesn't quite work. Um, some of them only support a, a certain number of baud rates. So they only support, you know. 1200 to 115k they don't support the ultra high baud rates like three megabaud and you're probably like well when would i ever need three megabaud but you will right there's always that once in a while that chip that's like it really wants to be run at one megabaud or higher and, it, and that's really high you need pretty good precision to be able to do um serial at that baud rate so that's another thing or weird baud rates like 31 250 31 250 isn't a you know multiplier of 9600 or 2400 but it's used for MIDI, and that is also pretty useful too. Once in a while, you need something that takes you know USB serial and can convert it to a MIDI baud rate. Um, or on the ESP8266, I think they use like 77k baud or 77.4 something something. So there's there's times when you'll get these weird these weird ass baud rates, or you have to do something with the control lines. And so I will say I've I've tried a lot of converters and they're not all equivalent they're not all drop in you definitely want to use it in the weirdest cases that you expect to use it um especially weird baud rates high baud rates um and uh control line you know noodling any uh, questions yeah we'll do a question during a great search if that's okay yeah. um what's the drawback of using a chip as a controller and a converter um you know, it's actually probably okay these days because I think if you use like TDUSB, it's really solid. Um, there's just, um, just make sure again, it does control line stuff. Make sure that it does the baud rates you want. Um, 
you know, some of these are just like, you know, like the Scilabs and FTDI ones. They're really rock solid. And, I've, you know, you use them and I've never had an issue. Um, I just think it's riskier if you use your own chip, although you might be able to save a couple, couple cents. You know, it depends on the quantities you're purchasing. And of course, it's another programming step you have to take care of. It's like another part of your um, production process, which might be annoying. There's also the chance that it gets... Um, it gets erased somehow, you know, um, chips, if, if you don't set like your brownouts or if there's a bootloader, it could actually get damaged. Um, you know, once in a rare, rare while, you know, people would get Arduinos that we manufactured and they'd say, oh, the chip has, it's coming up as the DFU, the 16U2 got erased. And we can never figure out why, because it would never have made it through the test procedure if it hadn't gotten programmed, but something, it was really rare. Again, it was like one out of like 10,000 and we just replaced them and we, you know, I, we eventually did, I think, figure out we just kind of like add in a secondary check or something. Um, but it's just, it's just another thing that can fail, basically. Um, so that said, uh, you know, the FT series are really good. Um, doesn't look like there's a lot of these in stock. One thing that is in stock is the, um, I, again, I haven't tried the Max Linear, although I'm, I'm curious to, um, but the CP2102s I found to be... Um, very good and reliable. I like these chips, you know, and I'm, I'm revising the CP2104 to use them. They're not completely pin compatible with the CP2104. They're really close, but they do need an extra resistor divider, which I think is what changed. I think what, what made them switch from the 04 to the 02 is probably something with the voltage detection, you know, maybe um, there was some risk of damage. And so, um, yeah, the CP2102 is maybe a little bit more uh, reliable, right? Because it's like, these are installed in, in so many devices. But these um, these are, are pretty good chips, and they come in, um, I'll say that they come in a different couple different flavors. This is the 20-pin. And they also come in, uh, I think, a 28-pin. This is the 28. And then I think they come in a 24, and the 24 is like the default, is the default maybe? I don't remember, but look at, you can look at the data sheet. Yeah, there's the 20 and the 24 and the 28. Um, and the, each one is, of course, a larger package, but it has more like control lines and LEDs and GPIO type things. So um, that said, um, I, I do like the, the Scilabs ones. I like the FTDI ones. Those have been the most reliable for me and the ones that can do the highest baud rates, you know, flawlessly pretty much. Okay, and that's a great search. Okay. Oh, can you pull up my um, my Twitter page? Because I was telling folks uh, the so the black and white photos, behind the scenes stuff that we're doing, and just like art stuff because it's been eighteen months of uh, this one. Yeah, I mean, not doing art and more. So I'm gonna go to your computer. Can you scroll up to the top? Go back to the top. Go back to the top. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you wanted to see like what's going on at Adafruit or some past art stuff, it's all in black and white, and uh, that's the, I have these very. I don't use any text. Using Twitter in ways you're not supposed to, like a good hacker does. Bad tweets. Yeah, and I'm like, you know, using it to, to show some of the things that goes on in a day-to-day -day basis at Adafruit and more. There's my desk that has hack on it from a Radio Shack sign. There's a oh, trackball. Trackball. Yeah, um, and more. Um, and so you get a this chance to see. a black and white photo of a black and white Mac. Yeah, and then here's uh, Anil this and Lamore. Um, and then, you know, we're around New York City, and uh, there's a pick-and-place machine. There's Central Park, and there's uh, it's called Little Island. So there's a lot, and this is you know just a few blocks from Randolph. So you get a chance to see, um, through my eyes, all the shades of gray and more. All right. So that's a nice show, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll be uh, here next week. Um, there might be a weekend where we're not here, but I'll talk to Lady Ada about that because we're going to be out of town. But we'll see. Um, maybe we'll try to do a broadcast from somewhere else. We'll see how it goes. Um, uh, don't forget, please, go to adabox.com and get adabox because you're going to run out and then you're going to be like, oh man, why'd you run out? And then um, special thanks to uh, Arduino for shipping the thing. We bought it, don't worry. We didn't get anything for free. Um, so we have 10 of these. I think we're going to put them in the, the rest of them in the store just to sell them at cost. Yeah. Um, because, I don't know, you know, they, it was, they, they said you can order them and I'm like, okay, well, I'll try to get them for the store and can do that. So anyways... We'll see how it goes, but this goes to our collection of 
other Arduinos that we have throughout history, throughout time and space. Um, lots of things that's happened in Arduino land over the last 10 years. And uh, really happy that we could be part of the community. And we are right. still Is and probably nice? always going to be producing the best high quality open source libraries. And one thing you yes. can know for sure is if Adafruit does it, it's open source. All right, goodbye, everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. Later.